Slovakian freediver by the name of Martin Stepanek set an amazing world record in clear blue waters, clear tropical warm waters off the Cayman Islands with only the air in his lungs he dove down 295 feet. Wow. <laughs> well, punch, a punchline there. So from 2001 to 2012, he continued to set all these world records, ultimately diving down more than 400 feet on a single breath of air. He is now recognized as one of the leading pioneers of modern freediving education. As an amateur, swimmer, snorkeler, I can't even imagine it. I can't even imagine diving down hundreds of feet on a single breath of air. Most of us, you know, try to see how long we can hold our breath and what the most we can hold is, what, a minute? Two minutes, maybe, maybe. Deep sea divers can stay submerged underwater almost indefinitely as long as they have an oxygen line to the surface. Everyone knows that in order to live, you have to have air. And if you get cut off from that source of air, that source of life, the results, of course, can be disastrous. Thousands of years ago, there was a time when this earth was a paradise. There wasn't a sick person anywhere. No one ever died. No one was unhappy or lonely. No one was worried or depressed or afraid. But look around. What do we see in our world today? You and everybody you know struggles to some degree or another. We all have burdens and problems. We're all subject to death. And while living people experience so often loneliness and fear, emptiness and guilt, so many tried to find happiness, but happiness seems to slip through their fingers. So what happened? What changed in our world? Well, what happened is we human beings became disconnected from the source of life. We became disconnected from the source of everything we need. Just as deep sea divers are in big trouble if their oxygen line is cut, we've been in deep trouble down here. We've become disconnected from the source of life and joy and peace. Now to understand where the problem started, we go to the Bible, and of course we go to the first book of the Bible, to Genesis. The Bible not only provides answers about the problems of life, it gives us the solutions that we need. When God created people, when God created Adam and Eve, he placed them in a perfect world. It was paradise. The air was fresh and clean. The beautiful waters were unpolluted. There was no sickness, no heartache, no fear, no death. But as we learned in the Discover Prophecy meetings, a fallen angel came knocking on earth's door. One whom God created perfect rebelled against God in heaven. And that fallen angel came to this planet. And God gave Adam and Eve a choice. He gave them the choice to trust him and obey him. Instead, they chose to distrust him. They chose to disobey him. They chose to rebel. And they believed the lie of the evil one who said, if you eat of the, tree of the, the fruit of this tree, you'll be happier. You'll feel joy and exhilaration. You'll experience the heights of ecstasy. And Adam and Eve doubted God. They believed the lie and disobeyed God and obeyed the evil one. And instead of lasting joy and heights of ecstasy, they experienced fear, anxiety, insecurity, guilt, emptiness, and loneliness. And now this earth, this planet earth, is a planet in rebellion. All of us, unfortunately, experience what Adam and Eve did. But why? Why does sin produce so many negative feelings? The Bible gives us an answer in Isaiah 59, verse 2. It says, but your iniquities, your sins, have separated you from your God. Sin separates us from God. Sin separates us from the source of life and love, the source of joy. So how does this separation from God affect our lives? Separation is at the root of broken relationships. First, a broken relationship with God. Now, in the Genesis story, when Adam and Eve sinned, remember they tried to hide from God. We see that in Genesis 3, verse 8. 
they tried to hide from God. And men and women, people have been trying to hide from God ever since. And sin has not only separated us from God, but from each other. Adam said to God, the woman you made, it's her fault. Have you ever heard that said? It's her fault. It's his fault. And people have been blaming each other ever since. Conflicts and barriers in relationships exist because of sin, because of separation from God. Sin has separated us from God and each other and also with our world. Separated from God, our planet begins to deteriorate. Trees, flowers, streams of water begin to die. Animals become diseased. The whole planet deteriorates. Natural disasters occur worldwide. Our world is waxing old. So what are people to do? Well, some try to numb their pain with alcohol and drugs, illicit sex or material things. But our remedies only make our situations worse and relationships are further broken and we're taken further and further away from God. Separated from God, sin ultimately brings death. And the Bible teaches us the wages of sin is death. With death threatening us, how do we find peace? How do we experience lasting peace? We might yearn for a solution, but we cannot solve the problem of sin. Unless we're reconciled to God, we are doomed to death. We're doomed to eternal death. Popular thinking might lead you to look to a problem for a solution within yourself, but the problem of sin is within us. It is a problem within, a problem in our hearts. The Bible teaches us that we have a solution that has come to us from above. God promised in Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity. I will make a separation between you, Satan, and the woman Eve, and between your offspring and hers. He, Jesus, the offspring of the woman, shall bruise your head, and you, Satan, will bruise his heel. God put Satan on notice. God would separate Satan from the woman. One chosen one, one offspring, Jesus, would crush Satan's head, while Satan would bruise his heel. God promised he would send Jesus Christ the Messiah. The Messiah would crush the enemy's head. He would crush the enemy. He would destroy the enemy. In doing this, of course, Jesus would receive a terrible blow. His heel would be bruised, but he would not be destroyed. Praise God. Here's the first promise of the Messiah in Genesis. The promise is given in the Garden of Eden right after Adam and Eve sinned. God provided a glimpse of his plan of salvation. He already had a solution for our sin. Now you remember the story, for those that know the story, Adam and Eve tried to cover their sin and their nakedness with leaves. But the Bible teaches in Genesis that God actually covered them with animal, skin, animal skins. You see, in their worship of God, Adam and Eve sacrificed animals as a symbol of how they would be saved. Later, God said to his followers, the Israelite people in Exodus 25, 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God had a plan. God had a plan of salvation. He had a plan to eliminate condemnation and guilt. Now picture this. Suppose you're an Israelite and you get angry with a friend and you do something to retaliate and hurt him. That is Israelite sinned against God and his friend. He feels guilt. He feels estranged from God. He feels loneliness and fear. That's what happens when we sin. To help him understand the plan of salvation, God said, bring a lamb. Bring a lamb to the sanctuary and confess your sin over that lamb and then take that lamb's life. That innocent lamb will die in your place. You came here guilty, but you can go home free. Every sacrificial lamb pointed forward to the Messiah, the Christ who would come. John the Baptist introduced Jesus with these words, saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why bear your own sin? Why bear your own sin with guilt and shame when God has sent his one and only Son to take away your sin? Jesus came to die the death we deserve so that we could receive the life he deserves. He is the bridge between us and God, the Father. You know, when I, when I think of all those Old Testament sacrifices, all those Old Testament sacrifices, those, those precious lambs being sacrificed, I think, how terrible. What a terrible thing to happen. But how much more terrible that God's own lamb, Jesus, his son, had to die in our place. And yet without Jesus, we would all have to bear our own sin. 
as we've journeyed through the prophecies in these last few weeks at the seminar, we discover that in the book of Revelation, in the heart of the book is Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb of Revelation. Revelation presents two paths, God's way and man's way. Revelation presents two leaders, the Lamb Jesus Christ, who lovingly invites us to follow him and give him allegiance, or the beast who coerces allegiance. Revelation invites us to worship the Lamb. Revelation 15, 1 verse 5 says, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus is the Lamb of Revelation. In Revelation 5, 12, angels are pictured around God's throne, singing, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Revelation 12, 11 says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 13, 8 also describes the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Even before Adam and Eve sinned, God had a plan. And as soon as they sinned, God put his plan of salvation into place. At the center of the book of Revelation is chapter 14. And there three angels are portrayed. And the first angel is proclaiming the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel is proclaiming the good news that we are redeemed by God. Salvation comes to us through Jesus on the cross. Revelation is inviting all of us to this great celebration of salvation in heaven. In our last meeting, last Friday night, Pastor Brian spoke of heaven. And in Revelation 19, verse 9, we're invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. What is so amazing is Jesus himself is coming to take us, to personally take us to that celebration. He will come a second time. His second coming is made possible by his first coming. Describing the second coming with symbols in Revelation 19.13, it says, He, Jesus, was clothed with a vesture, a robe dipped in blood. Yes, he comes back in glory and victory. He comes back as King of kings and Lord of lords. But we're also reminded that Jesus is still the Lamb of God. He died for us. He shed his blood for us. He comes with grace. Jesus invites all of us to go with him to heaven. And in Revelation 22, 17 is this invitation. Whosoever will, let him, let her, take the water of life freely. You can come freely to Jesus today. You can confess your sins to Jesus today and every day. Accept his grace and forgiveness. When Jesus went to that cross, he was thinking of you. He died for you. It's hard to comprehend. This is one of the verses of the Bible that kind of boggles my mind. But 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he, God, made him Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ never sinned, but he accepted the guilt of our sins. He allowed himself to be tempted and treated as a sinner. Jesus was willing to risk being lost forever so that we could be saved in eternity. A student asked his teacher, so teacher, how long is eternity? She said, picture a seagull swimming or flying over to where there is an ocean, and the seagull takes a drop out of the ocean and flies away. And the seagull keeps coming back every thousand years to take a drop out of the ocean. When the ocean is dry, it's just the beginning of eternity. Eternity is a very long, long time. Praise God. Jesus loves us so much. He wants to spend eternity with us. Even now, he wants to take away our sin and guilt. He was condemned so that we could be saved. God promises us, reassures us in Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Salvation is not about what I do, but through what Jesus has done. He lived a perfect life, but even more, he died in my place. He died in your place. The Bible says, by grace you have been saved. It is a gift. It is a gift you cannot buy salvation. It can only be received as a gift from God. What steps can you take to receive this gift? How can you experience salvation? Pastor Brian spoke of being saved by grace through faith in the seminar. 
And considering all that we have learned and all that we will continue to learn, is there anything more important than experiencing Jesus and his salvation? On a day when we're celebrating salvation through baptism and the profession of faith of brothers and a sister here in our church, can I share with you some simple steps for receiving Jesus as your Savior? Steps to finding peace of mind, peace of heart. First is accept. Accept the truth that God is good, that God is love. But there's something else to accept, and that is to accept that you are a sinner. The problem is not with God. The problem is with me. The problem is with us. Romans 3.23 tells us, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The truth is we have been separated from God by sin. And as you come to God, a good and loving God, admit to him that you are a sinner. Accept that hard truth. But second, believe. Believe the good news. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Believe he died on the cross for you. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe Jesus lived and died as your Savior. Believe in grace. Believe the good news. That's the second step. And third, confess. Confess your sins to God. And then as you're taking these steps to accept that you're a sinner and believe that Jesus died for you and, and confessing your sins to Jesus, be sure and claim the promise of 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is what? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And more than that even, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you say, Pastor, you don't know. I got a lot of problems in my life. I got a lot of hang-ups. I've sinned so many times. I've lied. I've gotten so angry. I've hated. I've committed adultery and other serious sins. How can God forgive all that? The Bible teaches us Christ's blood is sufficient for all of our sins. Accept that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus died for you. Confess your sins. And then fourth, decide. Decide that you will follow him. Ask him into your life. Receive him as your savior. Jesus personally says to us in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door. I stand at the door of your heart and life. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. I will have a relationship with you. I will have fellowship with you. So I want to ask you, if you ask Jesus into your heart today, will he come in? He has promised, I will come in. Can you be reassured or assured that your sins are forgiven? Acts 3.19 says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Repentance means that we're sorry for our sins and willing to change. You can know that your sins are blotted out. But even more than that, by receiving Jesus, you actually receive eternal life. It's a gift that God is longing to give each and every one of us here today. Eternal life can be yours today. 1 John 5, 12 says, He, she, who has the Son, has life. What kind of life? Eternal life. When you accept Christ, you may not always feel like you're saved. We have ups and downs. Our emotions go all over the place. But you can know you have eternal life. You can say, I am his and he is mine, you can know that he is your savior. Martin Luther was a very troubled young man. He believed in God, but had not experienced the joy of knowing Jesus as his personal savior. And in the year 1505, that was a long time ago, in 1505, Martin Luther was walking through a German forest when there was a terrible storm that drove him into, to his knees. There was thunder, there was lightning. He was terrified. He looked up and cried out to the only patron saint he knew, St. Anne. And he cried out, oh, St. Anne, please protect me. And the lightning flashed, the thunder roared. He was still terrified. He continued to pray. He said, protect me, protect me, and I'll become a priest. And pretty soon the storm settled down. The rain stopped, the sky cleared, and the sun even came out. And Luther, Martin Luther, was faithful to his promise. He entered a monastery. 
But to his surprise, in the monastery, he still felt separated from God. He still was living with all this guilt and condemnation. In the monastery, he endured penance after penance. Still he had no peace. He'd stay up into the wee hours of the morning. He would even beat himself. He'd think, he'd think you know, my body is sin sinful. If I just beat it enough, I'll have peace. If I just fast long enough, enough, I'll, I'll have peace. I must do something to somehow um, satisfy this offended God. He just had such a, such a negative view of God as his father. Fortunately, he began to study the Bible. Amen. He started to study his Bible for himself and eventually discovered the wonderful Bible, call, Bible letter called Romans. And in Romans, he read something amazing. He read Romans 6.23, which says, For the wages of sin is death, yes, but what's the rest of it? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Martin Luther prayed for that gift, and suddenly a peace flooded his soul, the peace that passes understanding. And he sensed a freedom from guilt as he had never felt before. But then, soon one night after this happened, while he was sleeping, he had a dream. And in the dream, Satan appeared to him and unrolled a scroll of Martin's sins. Very specific sins. Cheating, lies, unclean thoughts. And Luther knew in the dream that these sins were his. And the devil asked him, are these your sins? And Martin in the dream said, yes. And the devil asked, are the wages of sin death? Yes. The devil asked, must you die? And then Luther in the dream said, move your hand. And the devil said, no. And Luther said, in the name of Jesus Christ, move your hand. And when he said the name of Jesus Christ in the dream, the devil trembled and fled. Under his hand, it said, from 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses Martin Luther from all of his sins. According to 1 John 1 7, that blood can cleanse you today. It can bring you peace and lasting joy in the Lord. Maybe you have accepted Christ only on the surface, in name only. And you cannot say that you have the assurance of salvation today. You haven't this lasting sense of peace with God. I invite you to come with me. Come with me to Pilate's Judgment Hall, just before the death of Christ. Listen as Jesus is mocked and scorned. Watch as he is whipped and beaten. And if that isn't bad enough, a crown of thorns is jammed onto his head. From there, come with me through the city streets, where crowds of people are yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Come up a steep hill called Calvary. Watch his nails are pounded into his hands and feet. He is being crucified. Behold the agony in his eyes. Blood trickles down his face. Who is he? He is Jesus, the Son of God. He is the Christ, the Messiah. He is the one who spoke the world into existence, who with the Father and Holy Spirit said, Let us make man in our image. The one at whose name angels sing, Holy, Holy, holy. Look at Jesus. Look at his body. Battered, broken, bruised, bleeding. Jesus loves you enough to die in your place. Can you turn from such love? John 3.16, a favorite verse of so many of us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, I love the whosoever, it doesn't say American or Asian, Christian or Jew. It says whosoever. That means you. That means me. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Peace can be yours. Freedom from guilt and condemnation can be yours. Eternal life can be yours. Can you turn from such love? How is it with you and Jesus? He gave his life for you. His blood was poured out for you. Today, Jesus wants to put your name in that verse that Martin Luther saw, 1 John 1, 7. He wants to say, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses Tyler from all of his sins. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses Daniel from all of his sins. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses Bonnie from all of her sins. 
His blood was shed for you. It cleanses you. Jesus has bridged the gap of separation sin has made. The blood of Jesus cleanses you from your sins. Today, Jesus is calling you. He loves you. And he wants to bless your life more in so many more ways. Will you receive him into your heart and life today? Will you make a commitment to trust him and obey? Or renew your commitment to follow him, his love and teaching, his commandments? The deacons are going to come forward at this time. And we have some cards we're going to pass out, as we did during the seminar. And I'm just going to ask that you take a stack that they hand you and just pass them down the row. If there's some extras, it's okay. Just put them beside you. We can pick them up later. They're just going to pass these out very quickly. We want everybody to have a card. We'd like everybody to have a card. But before we go over the card, we're going to have a prayer. We're going to pray a personal prayer of accepting Jesus, receiving Jesus. Um, but we're going to take a minute for everyone to make sure that they've got a card. Is everybody getting a card? It's, take, it's going to take a minute. That's okay. I want everybody to have a card. Before you fill out this card, I'm going to invite you to pray. I'm going to invite you to pray a simple prayer, a prayer of faith, a prayer of repentance, a prayer in which I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray out loud a personal prayer, a prayer that I've prayed before, but I'm going to pray it again today. I'm going to invite you to make my prayer your prayer. Does everyone have a card? Has everyone got a card? Is there anybody that's missing a card? Maybe we want to take a card up to the balcony. I don't know, perhaps. Whether you've prayed this before or not, I invite you to pray and receive Jesus into your heart. And let my prayer be your prayer today. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you for being a good father, a loving father. We praise you for that. Lord, I accept that I need a Savior. I believe Jesus is my Savior and that he died for my sins. I'm sorry for my sins and I ask that you forgive me. I receive Jesus into my heart and life. Thank you. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. Please fill me with your spirit and love so that I can love and follow Jesus. So I have a question to ask you. If you've prayed this prayer, where is Jesus right now? Is he not in your heart? Is he not in your life as he's promised? Look at what the Bible says in 1 John 5, 12 and 13. It says, he, she, who has the Son, has what? Has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Let's read on the screen the, the rest of the verse together. Let's read it together. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. Praise God. Now notice the card. It says, my decision for Jesus. And I would just invite you to respond and share this with the pastoral staff. By turning it in, we'll provide an opportunity for you to do that. But I invite you to to uh, consider making a decision for Jesus. And it might be just a renewal of a decision for Jesus. But notice the first response. Dear God, I'm sorry for my sins and I accept Jesus as my Savior. I receive him into my heart. If you'd like that to be a response today, I'd encourage you to check that. The second response, I've wandered away from Jesus and I renew my commitment to him. Another response, I'd like to be baptized. Perhaps you'd like to just talk about being baptized or prepare for baptism. Perhaps it's rebaptism. If you have not been baptized by immersion, I just give you a special invitation to consider that, and you can check that box. Then there's another response, I have been baptized, but would like to become part of this church family by profession of faith, or if there's a special prayer request. And as you're filling out this card, Pastor Randy will sing, Let's, uh, let's consider what our response is, what our decision is for Jesus today, shall we? Tears. 
is so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word Just to rest upon his promise Just to know the saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and all Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh for grace to trust him more. I invite you to turn in those cards, turn them over, pass them to the middle aisle, just pass the, uh, the cards down, and the deacons will pick up the, uh, the cards from the center aisle. Can you do that while Randy continues to sing? Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to trust his cleansing blood And in simple faith to plunge me Neath the healing cleansing flood Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him How I've proved him more and more Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust him more I'm so glad I learned to trust him Precious Jesus, save your friend And I know that he is with me Will be with me to the end Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him How I've proved him more and more Jesus, Jesus Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, for grace to trust Him more. Precious Savior we have in Jesus. What a precious Savior. If you would like to pray with a pastor, there's Pastor Peggy and Pastor Randy, Pastor Brian can come to the front. I'll, be, I'll remain at the front. If you'd like to come and confirm with a pastor in prayer the decision you made today, we invite you to come by, come forward um, here at the end of the service. Now I'd like to invite everyone to stand for a closing benediction. Shall we, shall we stand together in the Lord? Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. We praise you for being such a wonderful and precious Savior. And now, as the scripture reads in 2 Peter 3.18, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. <laughs>